I want to share a little bit about the origin of today's sermon. Um, it'll be a little bit briefer than normal, but prayerfully it will resonate with some of us. Um, it's been one of those weeks. Um, I had a 30-page paper due on Friday, the last of the semester, and the truth be told, it was wearing me out. I wound up pulling some overnighters this week, and that's just not my norm, so I've been tired. The Holy Spirit intervened in a major way on Tuesday, though, giving us one of the best Bible studies we've had in a long time. As we began to talk about not only how to read the Apostle Paul, but how to deal with Scripture overall. When Bible study was over, I indicated to everyone, listen, I've got a paper to write, I'm leaving, I'm a little bit stressed, I'm tired, and I've got to get this paper done. On my way out, a sister pulled me to the side and said, Pastor, there's a young lady in the back um, who wants to pray with you. I was a little frustrated, I'm on my way out, I've got a paper to write. It's, it's one of those weeks. And I literally heard the Holy Spirit say, don't ever be in such a rush that you can't pray with somebody. So I put on my big boy pastor boots and walked to the back a little unwillingly, but following the Holy Spirit. And I met a young lady and our conversation almost brought me to tears. Dr. Scruggs, she said, I'm giving up on God. I don't want to be a Christian any longer, and I'm not coming to church anymore. Strange, because she was there on a Tuesday night. We talked some more, and she began to share with me all the bad things that were happening in her life. Couldn't catch a break. If it wasn't one thing, it was another. And this is what she said, Pastor, I've been praying, and God ain't answering. I've been coming to church, nothing's happening. Been reading my Bible, and it's still getting worse. She looked me dead in my eye and asked me, what's the point? Why should I keep believing in God and all this is still happening to me? I didn't know really what to say, and I'm almost embarrassed to tell you that because she dug her heels in and was ready to give up on God. And there was seemingly nothing I could say to her that was gonna bring her out of that moment. So I said all I knew to say, I said, can I pray with you? Her response, you can try. Nothing you say is gonna make me believe in God. I knew at that moment I couldn't fully minister to her and so I asked her if she would be open to have a conversation later. She said to me, what's the point? You're not gonna make me believe in God. I said, can we at least sit down and you allow me to hear everything that's happened to you? She gave me her phone number and either she gave me the wrong number or I wrote it down incorrectly because I wasn't able to catch her. And what I was going to share with her has now become what I share in this sermon. Because I believe she is not the only one that has reached a place where if the truth be told, you've wanted to ask, what's the point? I know you can't really identify yourself because it's Sunday, it's sanctuary, it's 9.30, you look Baptist. And you need your neighbor on your pew to believe that you walked in and all is well with your walk with God. But, but if I know you the way I know me, somebody today is either there, has been there, or is on their way there of looking at what you're going through and you're wondering how could God let this happen to me? You know, somebody tell me he's preaching to you right now. He's preaching to you. I want you to hear a reading from a book that causes us to wrestle with these issues. It is one of the most 
dangerous and difficult books in all the Bible. It's right in the middle of your Bible. When you open up to the middle, you're probably going to get to Job. And I want you to hear a few verses from the last chapter of Job's story in chapter 42. If you're physically able, won't you stand? The scripture will be on the screen. You can read along silently as I read aloud. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and accept him lest I deal with you according to your folly because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord commanded them for the Lord had accepted Job. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. When it's over, you may sit in the presence of the Lord. The book that follows Job, the book of Psalms, is arguably the most loved book of the Bible. Everybody in here knows one or two Psalms. You know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Somebody here, you know Psalm 30. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Maybe you're familiar with Psalm 150. Let everything that has breath Go on, help me preach. Praise ye the Lord. If you're like me, you like Psalm 37. Fret not thyself over evildoers, neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for in due season they shall wither and be cut down like the green grass. Somebody here, you've hung your hat on Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? D. Wallace, everybody in here knows a psalm because the psalms are the most loved scriptures. But Job is the most lived scripture. You may never have read Job. You may not have memorized any of the content, but you have walked in every verse of this book. Because there's not a one of us in here who's graduated from fifth grade who has not reached a place in life where you look at what you're going through, you envision the God you believe in, and something don't match. Everybody in here has come to a place where you've wanted to ask the question all of us have to ask, all of us have to answer. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? 
I, I know you want to look saved and your Bible is big and you know the third verse of blessed quietness. <laughs> but there's not a one of us in here who, if we be honest, can say that life has not at some moment put you in a place where you wanted to look at God, even if it was in the privacy of your own prayer closet, and ask God, why? Why would God let this happen to me? Beloved, in the language of theology and seminary, this is the issue called theodicy. We come to church to learn. Theodicy. Everybody say theodicy. theodicy. If you know roots, theo, you know God, and the dissy has something to do with justice. Here's a good definition of theodicy. Theodicy is the Christian attempt to defend and define God's holiness and God's justice in the midst of experienced evil. Say it again. Theodicy is the attempt of the believer to defend and define the holiness and justice of God in the midst of experienced evil. Cliff Note Version, theodicy is when the believer tries to reconcile an evil, a tragedy, a sickness that you are going through and yet still believe in the God you believed in before the tragedy knocked on your door. It is the question of wondering how could God let this happen in my life? How could God be holy? How could God be just? How could God be everything the preacher said he is, and yet I'm still going through this? I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to walk right. I've been praying. I go to church. I read the Bible. I'm nice to folk I don't even like. And yet this still happened to me. Theodicy, this wrestling with the justice and the holiness of God in the midst of experienced evil. The reason it's difficult is that it draws into conflict two characteristics of God that before you go through evil, you held in harmony. Can I teach today? Um, I don't know if we'll shout, but we're going to learn something. That when the believer, when one who loves God and trusts God and is trying to do right by God goes through evil and tragedy, two characteristics of God that you held in harmony are now in conflict with each other. Because in the midst of theodicy, in the midst of your Job situation, in the midst of evil that doesn't seem right to you, two characteristics of God are fighting with each other. The omnipotence of God and the love of God. Because when you get in your Job moment, when you're in a theodicy struggle, when you can't understand why God would allow bad things to happen to good people, love and omnipotence are challenged. And Dr. Scruggs, people land in one of a few places. Some say, well, that means God doesn't love me. Because if God is omnipotent and God can do whatever God wants to do, and yet God allows me to go through this, that must mean that God's love must be questioned. How could a loving God let it go down like this? How could a loving God let mama die like that? How could a loving God let that be my diagnosis? I've never smoked a day in my life. How do I get lung cancer? God must not love. Because if God can do anything and God chooses not to do something, that means God is not love. But if you don't reject God's love, then you're forced to reject God's omnipotence. Because if God loves me and cares about me and this still happens, that must mean God can't do anything about it. He loves me, but the fact that it's lung cancer must mean that God can't, so God is not omnipotent. And then, Marcia, there's some who come to the most dangerous place. Not only is God not love, and not only is God not omnipotent, 
God ain't real. Because the crossroad of a Job experience and a theodicy struggle, seeing bad things happen to good people, causes people to give up on God. You can't convince me a God is real. I've been praying, I've been reading Bible, I go to church and it still has not changed. There is no God and what is the point? All of us have gotten there. All of us have reached the point where you may not testify on Sunday, but you know that life revolves around this question. It's the question that's in all of Scripture and in everyone who believes in God. The question goes like this. If God, dot, 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 why? dot, 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 fill in the blank. If God loves me, why is this happening? If God answers prayer, why are my prayers not being answered? If God is real, why is this hell happening to me? Anyone who has a theodicy moment, anyone who's honest about walking in Job's shoes, Anyone who knows that the truth of the matter is that you've been in that place where God didn't make sense to you? When God's will didn't make you feel good? You're forced to wrestle with a secondary question that literally undergirds the first. Is it all right to get deep today? Can we, can we put on thinking minds? Because when you have a theodicy moment and you wrestle with God, when you've got evil that doesn't make sense, tragedy that you should have been protected from, sickness that should never have found you, it forces you to ask another question. And that question is this, how much evil is God responsible for? Stay with me, you all know the story of Job, right? Let me give you the cliff note version in case you failed Sunday school. Job. <laughs> Job lives in a land called Uz. The Bible says he's the holiest man in the land. Job is so holy, God brags on him. God says there's nobody like Job. Can you imagine what it feels like to have God brag on you? God brags on Job because Job has earned it. Job is righteous. You go ahead and read Job. When you get to chapter 1, verse 1, it's his religious resume. He's upright. He fears God. He shuns evil, and he does what is right. Job is the brother who's righteous in God's eyes. Job goes to church. Air Sunday. Job reads his Bible every day. Job prays in the morning, at noon, and at night. Job is the brother men want to be when they grow up. Chapter 1 ends with a troubling scene. We're taken to the throne room of God. And there we're told that the host of God is there in God's presence. And while the host of God is in God's presence, Satan, the evil one, shows up. Let me just pause so that you know that whenever God is present and the host of God are gathered, Satan always shows up. Don't look at nobody. Don't, don't look. <laughs> Satan shows up. God has a conversation with Satan. It goes a little something like this. Hey, Satan, where you been? Satan's response, chilling. <laughs> Just doing what I like to do, messing with folk. Trying to find somebody that I can wreak havoc on. And Judy, God says to Satan, have you tried Job? 
God volunteers Job for struggle. Now, Lord, I love you with all my heart. And I want you to brag on me too one day. But the one thing I don't ever need God to do on my behalf is volunteer me for struggle. God allows it and Satan performs it. So the question then becomes, who's responsible? The hell that Job goes through, the losses Job endures, the death Job sees, the sickness Job wrestles with. Is it God or is it Satan? Who's to blame for the tragedies we go through? Who's responsible for the evil? Who has to give an account for the sickness? Is it God's allowance or is it Satan's work? Beloved, this, this issue that we wrestle with in Job is an issue theologically that divides the body of Christ. Now, now we don't always talk about it, we stay at surface level, but in the depth of our beliefs, there are two categories of people in this church. There are those who are over here and there are those who are over there. If I ask the question correctly and ask you which camp you're in, you're gonna find that some people on your pew are over here and some people on your pew are over here. On this side are those who maybe by not identification align themselves with the theology of a French reformed theologian named John Calvin. John Calvin. John Calvin is where the theological position of Calvinism comes from. Calvinism is the rooting of the reformed church and the Presbyterian church. So whenever you see reformed or Presbyterian, know that by default, that's a Calvinistic theological perspective. Yes, sir. Teach Pastor West. <laughs> Calvinism believes that everything is predetermined by God. Everything is the will and the work of God. Calvinism even says, that even the evil you go through, the sickness you endure, the tragedy that falls on your lap, that's God's will. Now, you may not understand it, and you may not like it, but God is in control of it, and God is doing something in your life that our human minds just cannot understand. So a Calvinist can see a child killed by a drunk driver and say, it's God's will. You don't like it, you don't understand it, but God is in control. Some of us are Calvinists. If you've ever looked at someone in a struggle and told them, God will never put more on you than you can bear, you are a Calvinist. Have you ever had somebody tell you that and you weren't You want to tell them something? <laughs> because the Calvinist says it's all God. God is doing it. God is in control. God is working it out. Don't question it. Let God be God. That's this side. Those who say God's in control. Then over here are the free will people. The people who believe in human choice. And the people who say that all evil is not God. Because this group has a problem saying that even the bad things are God at work. This group is like me. This group isn't going to stand at a funeral and tell a mother your child being killed by a drunk driver is God's will. This group believes that evil is the result of human choice that we make sinful decisions that have consequences in our lives and the lives of people around us and the lives of people to come after us. 
that sin and our willful disobedience of the will of God brings evil and tragedy into the world that is multiplied so that our children inherit a more sinful world than the one we were born into because our sins multiply the destruction of God's plan and that the world has consequence because of our choice. That evil is not God's will, it's the consequence of choice. So when you stand over here, this group got you. Because this group looks back at you and says, well, then you've got to answer why God didn't stop it. If it's your choice and God knows it's going to be a consequence, why doesn't God stop you from making the choice? Why doesn't God stop the drunk driver before the child is hit? Why doesn't God, in his omnipotence, make the car not start? Why doesn't God make the drunk driver get arrested before the child has been hit? This group looks at you and says, you got to give an account for why God doesn't stop your choice. Your answer has to deal with the depth of another term called soteriology. Can, can we get deep today? Is it all right? I haven't lost you. Touch somebody, tell them, you better wake up. You better wake up. <laughs> this, this ain't kindergarten today, no. <laughs> Soteriology. Put it back up, please. Soteriology is really about the doctrine of salvation. Your standing on human choice affects salvation. Yeah. Because this side also believes salvation is a choice. If sin is a choice, so is salvation. You got to choose God. You've got to choose to surrender to Jesus Christ. God never forces you to do anything. You have to choose it. God offers salvation, but you must make a decision to say yes to what God has offered because human choice is involved in salvation. You can choose to be evil and you can choose to be holy. This side over here, that's what we believe the tree in the Garden of Eden was all about. Adam has to make a choice. God's not going to force him. Adam has to choose. And unfortunately, Adam chose wrong. Now, if you get this, then now you get them. Because when we say salvation is a choice, we have to come back over to you all. Because you all have argued that there is no human choice, that everything is God's will. And so in that, Calvinism and Presbyterianism holds to a doctrine called double predestination. God, Pastor West, you're getting so deep in the center. <laughs> double predestination is tied to what you've heard as the doctrine of the elect. Because remember, for this side, there's no free choice. It's all God's will. So the Presbyterian Calvinist side says this, that salvation is not really a choice. Salvation's predetermined by God. You may think you chose, but God already knew that was going to be it. You are the elect of God. God has predetermined that you would be saved. It wasn't that you had a choice. It's that you became what God had already predestined you to be. Now, when they take this stance, we got them. When they take that stance, we got them. Because if salvation is the will of God and it's not your choice, so is hell. So the doctrine of the elect becomes difficult because now you've got to give an account for you saying that God has determined you're going to heaven, but she's going to hell and there's no way out of it. She, Liz, don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. <laughs> Deacon Liz Mendoza is one of the best people I know. She loves Jesus. Uh, but on this side, now, because you believe everything is the will of God, even evil, you have to give an account for God creating people to go to hell. Right. Right. And that doesn't set well with us. So when you get to that point, y'all start coming back over here. <laughs> because we got the human will, the free choice. Now, listen, in the extreme, none of us are the extremes. Really, really, very few of us are all the way over there or all the way over here. 
Most of us are, you know, we... Depends on what's going on. I, I might be... <laughs> maybe it's God's will or maybe I brought it on myself. I don't know. You know we, we just, we waffle. We... I'm right about here. I don't believe that every bad thing that happens is God's will. I don't believe that evil we experience is God's will at work. I don't believe that a child getting hit by a drunk driver is God's will. I believe that we make choices that bring evil into the world. But here's what I do believe, that in the midst of that evil, we serve a God who is able to step in the midst of the evil we experience and God can work it for good. God can turn it around. God can redeem it. God can transform it. God can bring some good out of it. That God is not always the responsible party but God's the one who fixes it. So when Adam chooses incorrectly, God puts in place a plan to fix it called Jesus. So that there's a way to correct the evil that has been done if I have faith. Faith is what gives God access to the evil you are experiencing. Faith is what allows God to get in the midst of something that God may not have willed for your life, but God wants to clean up and turn around. The whole of the book of Job really hinges on Job's confession in chapter 13, verse 15, where Job says this, if God slays me, I will trust him. If God kills me, I'm going to have faith in him. If mama still dies, I'm going to believe in God. Nothing will break my faith in God. <laughs> Beloved, faith is what allows God to work it together for good. Faith is what allows God to take the weeping of night and turn it into joy in the morning. If you don't have faith, you have locked God out of your experience. Faith gives God access. Let me see if I can explain this. Um, Dr. Scruggs, about a year ago, I took my oldest son down in the Carolina. We wanted to go visit a boarding school that he was thinking about going to. And I asked my mother to pick up my youngest son from school. So my mom went to go get Cooper from school, and when she came back home, she found out that she had inadvertently locked the garage door, and they are locked out of the house. They can't get in the house. My mom, in her 80-plus-year-old self, decides she's going to try to break in the house. <laughs> she literally tries to break the garage door, bang on it, if you go to my garage door now, they're dents from her using her cane trying to, <laughs> trying to open the door. She couldn't get in the house. She steps outside, she looks up, and she sees that one of the windows to the kitchen is open. She tells Cooper, I want you to climb on grandma's car, get up on the roof of the car, and get to the window, climb in through the window, and come open the garage door. This is why she can't keep the kids. <laughs> She's telling my 10-year-old son, get on top of the car and climb through the window and break in the house. Thank God the boy's got enough sense <laughs> that he called me. He said, Dad, we are locked out of the house. Grandma's trying to break in the house. We can't get in. 
she wants me to get on her car and climb through the window and come through the kitchen. He said to me, Dad, can you give me access to the house? He knows that on my phone, I have the app that controls the alarm and the front door. So he calls and says, Dad, tap your phone so that the door will unlock and I can come in the house without trying to break in the house. So I get on my phone, I tap the app, I hit unlock. Even though I'm miles away, the door unlocks. He can walk in the house. He goes downstairs. He opens up the garage door. My mama says, how did you break in the house? Cooper says, I didn't have to break in. I just made a call to the one who gives me access so that I can get into the midst of the house and I can handle the situation. The Lord is not going to break into your experience. God needs you to have faith to give him access to the sickness, access to the death, access to the heartbreak, access to the layoff. But if you have faith, do me a favor, touch somebody, tell them, if you have faith, God has access. If you believe, God can change it. If you hold to God, God will work it out. If you don't give up on God, God will make a way. Faith gives God access. So, I know I'm Baptist and the president of Baptist is in the house. I'm supposed to give you three points. I just have one point that I'm gonna say three times. <laughs> Don't give up on God. <laughs> Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Faith is the only thing that can hold you together in a moment like this. Don't give up on God. What faith allows you to do is to see that God's not done in this moment. Every scholar will tell you that the reason Job's story doesn't end until you get to chapter 42 is so that when you read through Job, you'll get a glimpse of a God who restores, a God who fixes it, a God who lets you know that no matter what you're going through now, your 42 chapters coming. Faith, faith says, Theron, I know what I see today, but in my eyes of faith, I see something more. Okay, I'm done. Um, Give you the, give you the best, best illustration. A few weeks ago, like many of you, I took my kids to go see the Avengers. We like Marvel movies, we like superheroes, we went to go see Avengers. Um, I, I did not like Avengers. If you've seen it, that's a horrible ending. Anybody seen the movie? Okay, okay, let me tell you something. I, I was mad in Avengers. We just got Black Panther. How y'all, how y'all, how y'all going? I mean, I, I'm mad. I, I, ain't, I saw Black Panther like five, four, five times. I don't want to see Avengers ever again. I was, I, mean, I was so mad in that movie. My son, literally, my youngest son was crying at the end of the movie. And I'm saying to myself, yo, this is some. <laughs> I mean, well, so when the movie was over, you know when Black Panther's over, we stand up clapping. We... <laughs> At the end of Avengers, everybody was just sitting there like, <laughs> nobody moved. Everybody sitting in disbelief like, how in the world did this happen? 
This wasn't supposed to happen. We're watching it. It ends. Everybody's disappointed. True story. Brother behind me gets up. He's walking out the theater and I hear him holler, yo, this is some... <laughs> he is furious. He's walking out because he's mad. And I just hollered at him, brother, don't leave yet. Because if Marvel does what Marvel does, at the end of the movie, if you just sit through some credits, there's gonna be a sneak preview of something that lets you know this story ain't over yet. I came by to talk to somebody who's sitting in this theater mad with God, disappointed with God, angry with God. Don't walk out yet. Don't quit yet. There's another story coming. Eyes of faith see that God's not done yet. The Bible says that God gives Job back all 10 of his children. 10 of his children were killed, Job got 10 back. We often shout about that, but any parent here knows you can't replace a child. If you've ever lost a child, having another one doesn't take away that pain. But it shows that God knows. I can't promise you that it'll go back to the way it was and all your dreams will be fulfilled and every prayer will be answered the way you want. But I promise you this, God adds something back to our lives. God puts something back in the equation that makes life livable again. All you got to have is faith. So my message is simple this morning as we close. Don't give up on God. I know some bad things have happened. All of us have been there. You've lost loved ones. Things happen to you that should not have happened to you. I'm over here. It may not be God's will, but God can fix it if you have faith. So this morning, rather than ending with an invitation to discipleship, I want to pray with the Job's in the sanctuary. Somebody came to church today on the brink of giving up. And I wanna pray with you. I'm gonna open the altar for you to come and I'm gonna ask you to do me a favor, church. If it's not for you, you don't have to come sit. But let people come without you trying to figure out why they're coming. Don't be that prayer person, one eye open, one eye closed, trying to see who. You know how saints are. Girl, she was at the altar. Her marriage must be falling. Let people, <laughs> let people come. If you know what it's like to walk in Job's shoes, come on to the altar. Let's pray together. I want to pray with those who need God just to help you strengthen your faith. We're not asking God to do anything other in this moment than to increase our faith. to help me believe that in the midst of this disappointment, it's not over, that God is still at work. God still has other options. God can add something back to my life that helps make life livable. As they're coming, won't you even now enter that space of prayer join us at the altar. Let's bow. Father, here we bow in your presence on holy ground. And our very presence in this place is a sign 
that we still believe. It would have been so much easier to stay at home, to give up and to walk away. Lord, I hope you see that I still have some amount of faith in me that you're able to work this thing out. My name is Howard, but I got Job written all over me. Don't understand why these things happen. Trying to figure out how you could love me and let me go through this. But Lord, I trust that you're real. Amen. I know that you love me. Yes. And I know you can do what needs to be done. The devil is attacking my faith and I refuse to let him win. Amen, amen, amen. So Lord, I declare right now in this moment of prayer that I trust you. Yes. I declare through the words of my lip, I know that you are real. Yes. Amen. Job said, I used to hear about you, now I've seen you. Yeah. Lord, I declare that I see you with my eyes and I know that you've not abandoned me, you've not forsaken me. It feels like it but that feeling is not true. So Lord, I ask now that you would speak to your daughters and your sons about what it means to continue to have faith in God even now. In spite of what you've heard, in spite of what's going down, in spite of the prognosis and the diagnosis, have faith in God. Yes. Even if that just means believing that God is real, and continuing to talk to God even when you don't get what you're talking about. Lord, we bow before you and ask you like the brother who came on behalf of his son, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help me, O oh God, in the places where my faith is feeble, where my belief is faltering, where my mind gets worried, where my heart is anxious, where doubt creeps in. God, give me a faith that defends against all that, that I might see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I just believe this is not the end and that you're able to do something else. God, work it in me now. Teach me what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. That I believe in spite of, I believe in the midst of, I believe even though all is happening around me, I still believe and trust in my God. So hear this Job prayer and show up for us the same way you did for Job. Restore to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. As you return to your seats, we're getting ready to leave this place. If you're with us today and you desire the great gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, or you're with us and you desire to become part of the church family, immediately after our benediction, our servant deacons will be at the altar to welcome and receive those whom the Lord will bring on this day to this place. As the Holy Spirit will call you, we will welcome you. We are grateful today for the voice of the Psalms of praise. who are gonna bless us in our final selection. And then we leave in the grace and the peace of our God.